Um, Middletown Public Schools, welcome to the second part of our webinar series that is featuring uh, Weston Kersnick and Eric Schinniger. But this week we got Weston Kersnick, week two. A uh, good friend of mine, I think last week, uh, Weston's message was <laughs> Weston's message was uh, just a phenomenal when we talk about uh, the five commandments of remote learning. I still want to pick your brain uh, regarding that, Weston. But more importantly, you know, the tools surplus and the strategy deficit. And I know that this week you're going to be really getting into um, it's not more about it's not it's not about the tools, right? The number of tools that you have. It's about the actual strategies and how and what the intentionality of how you will implement those strategies into your practices. But before we start, Weston, I would like to give a big shout out to all of our teachers uh, for Teacher Appreciation Week. And you guys have just been absolutely phenomenal. Um, and Weston, and I saw on one of your tweets that you had where what industry, what, what, what individuals will be able to make a cataclysmic shift within two weeks? And as our teachers, and our teachers are, I, I call them personally our heroes because um, our, our kids, our students, right, that we have, um, besides seeing their teacher or um, their parents, you know, the, the most impactful person that they have in their life is a teacher. And you, Weston, myself, and all the adults here, we wouldn't be where we're at today if it wasn't for a core foundation of teachers to have impact on our life. So to all the, our teachers in Middletown Public Schools, thank you for doing what you're doing. Thank you for continuing to do what you're doing. And thank you for being the heroes to all 4,559 students that we have in our district. So Weston, to you, my man. Michael, thank you, my friend. Yeah, you are 100% right. I posted the other day, you know, everyone likes to talk about like, oh, you know, school's broken, our education system is broken. And I posted the other day for all to see, uh, I am done. I am done hearing that message. Uh, and I challenged everyone out there to point to another industry that has so readily, so dynamically, and so willingly adapted to a completely different model of, uh, of how we do business without a bailout. And uh, you were right, it struck a chord uh, out there in the community, not just of educators, but of people at large, who then use that as an opportunity to express gratitude to our teachers and our educators. So uh, I am happy to continue to, that, to spread that message. Know that I will. Uh, education is not broken. And I, I will not continue to believe people who say that it is. Uh, it, it's been so fun uh, since I've been with you all. Uh, it, you should know that you all are not the only people uh, that I do these webinars with. I continue to do them uh, daily with folks around the country. And uh, as we've been doing these webinars around the country, I think it's been so interesting uh, because uh, one of the things that I always say is that uh, you know, technology, when you take a look at technology and when you take a look at technology's impact on education, uh, in the immediate, it rarely improves what happens. It simply magnifies what is already there. And so one of the things that I've noticed about technology and what it's magnified is it's magnified a lot of strengths that exist within our education system and within our teachers. And it has also at the same time magnified some of those places where uh, as a system, uh, we might have some deficits in some places that we're still growing. So with that in mind, I want to talk a lot today about engagement. And I want to make sure that as we're talking about engagement, we aren't using uh, the word engagement and fun as though they are synonyms. Uh, I will tell you, when you walk away from today's session, my hope is that is not that you turn into like the fun teacher. That is not my hope. My hope is that we think about ways to be uh, engaging and effective as teachers. Uh, and I just jotted this down here real quick. You know, you can be the most brilliant informed person on earth, but if your students are stuck in a state of boredom, then in all likelihood, our teaching is not making an impact. And one of the things that we discover is, especially as we start to dig into remote learning, we work really hard to make sure the kids aren't bored. And our quickest go-to, the quickest path to try to ensure that kids aren't bored is to default to tools. And so one of the things that I want, to, uh, want us to come to consensus about uh, right off the bat, before we get into what engagement sort of looks like, sounds like, feels like, is this. When we think about engagement, it is so important for us to understand, if you look sort of on the uh, spectrum of like less than and greater than, um, tools are much less engaging than strategies. 
when we think about engagement in the remote learning space, we have to start to think about instructional strategies because that is the quickest path to engagement. Tools to support those strategies will help, but we have to make sure that we're executing uh, things, uh, strategies that are pedagogically sound within the remote learning space. Remember, my friends, louder and longer is not a strategy. We have to figure out ways within a synchronous teaching environment where we can lean into those proven strategies that we know authentically work with kids. Uh, because remember, and Michael alluded to this uh, before, this is a, a slide that I show all the time. Our children can't succeed in classrooms where there is a tool surplus and a strategies deficit. I'll tell you that for uh, some of the research that I did for a book I was writing, I did some research. I wanted to know the average number of instructional strategies that your average classroom teacher nationwide could name and describe with accuracy. And I wanted to know the average number of digital tools, your Google Classrooms, your Kahoots, your Mentimeters, that your average teacher could name and describe with accuracy. And we'll come back to what those results were in just a moment. But before we do, everyone do me a favor and go to Kahoot. Let's go, let's play a Kahoot, shall we? Let's go to Kahoot here for a second. And uh, let me share a different part of my screen. Uh, everyone's gonna go gonna go to Kahoot and uh, uh, let's play a little Kahoot, shall we? Why not? Let me uh, do me a favor, guys. Uh, let me know that you can see my screen on your end. Yep, good to go. Uh, let's go to Kahoot, please, and let's play. You're gonna go gonna go to Kahoot.it, uh, and you are going to enter in the pin that you see here in front of you nine two nine zero one two four. Now, when you go to Kahoot.it, uh, many of you have used Kahoot before. You're gonna enter in this game pin and you're gonna be really uh, curious about why it will not allow you to enter in your name. Uh, that is because I have set it up so that it will assign you a random funny name because one of the things that so many of us are worried about, we wanna use these tools to engage kids in the online learning space, but we get really nervous about things like, ooh, what if, they what if they type in an answer or a username that's inappropriate? Uh, Kahoot lets us work around that. So remember, if you are the caring octopus or the space lion or the nimble lizard, like remember what your username is that you've been assigned by Kahoot. Uh, I want us to take an opportunity <clears throat> to take a look at instructional strategies for just a moment. And as we start to think about instructional strategies, let me move this to the bottom. Uh, as we start to think about instructional strategies for just a moment, I want to get a sense of where we are in the space of knowledge around instructional strategies. Um, uh, again, because it's so important if we're authentically going to engage kids in the remote learning space, especially in the synchronous remote learning space, it's so, so critically important not that we have a strong understanding about digital tools and what digital tools do, but we have a strong understanding about instructional strategy and how to leverage instructional strategies in the digital space. Now, uh, I've been talking for a really long time while I have been trying to allow many of you to log into kahoot.it and to type in the code. If you are still trying to click through and pick a username, pick whatever one comes up next. Uh, know that we are about to begin here in about the next five seconds. Now, uh, for those of you who have never played a Kahoot before, uh, this will be a two-question Kahoot. Very, very simple. Two-question Kahoot. Keep in mind, you get points for first and foremost accuracy. Second, you get points for speed. Uh, now, you'll have about 30, min uh, 30 minutes, 30 seconds to answer these questions. The question will flop up on the screen. You'll see on your phone or on your device in front of you. Uh, that you'll have four color options and shape options to choose from. Try to lock in your answer with as much uh, quickness and accuracy as possible. Looks like we've got about 310, 13 people who have logged in. If you are not logged in yet, uh, I apologize. I have got to get us started. Uh, so without further ado, let me move this all over. And let's begin with question number one. So let's think about instructional strategy, shall we? Here's a really common instructional strategy. Uh, Reciprocal teaching is an instructional strategy that's been around for a long time. Which of the following most accurately describes reciprocal teaching? Is it red, a strategy where students teach other students? Blue, a strategy where, teacher, where teachers and students ask higher order thinking questions? Is it yellow, a strategy where students work independently on tasks according uh, 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 on their own? Or is it green, a strategy where students predict, clarify, question, and summarize? Go ahead and lock in your answer real quick. 
What do you think it is? Final five seconds. What's reciprocal teaching? Good. So take a look at the results. Uh, Mike, let me know you, got, you can see the results there in front of you. Good. So uh, 74 of you uh, got this question right. I will tell you, most of you said reciprocal teaching is a strategy where students teach other students. I will tell you that is 100% the most common answer that is typically given when I ask what is reciprocal teaching. Uh, most people think it's a strategy where students teach other students, uh, and unfortunately, that would be incorrect. That is called peer tutoring. Now, is peer tutoring a highly effective strategy? Absolutely it is. But it's important for us to understand reciprocal teaching is a close reading strategy whereby anytime kids read anything, they make predictions, they uh, clarify vocabulary, they ask and answer questions, and they provide an objective summary of a text, right? Those four things must happen in order for reciprocal teaching to take hold. Uh, now, why am I talking about reciprocal teaching? Reciprocal teaching is an instructional strategy that has been around since the early 1960s and has been called reciprocal teaching since the early 1960s. And I will tell you in all of the work uh, that I do typically nationwide, fewer than 10% of teachers, of classroom teachers can tell me with accuracy what reciprocal teaching is. And uh, I don't expose that as a point of shame. I expose that uh, as a reinforcement of this notion that we exist in a world where we have a tool surplus and a strategies deficit. We can't implement these strategies if we don't know with 100% certainty, certainty what they are and how to execute them. We're going to come back to reciprocal teaching momentarily. Having said that, if you're uh, uh, Amazon mouse, congratulations, you are leading the way. Here we go. Let's go to uh, question number two. Final question. Final question, easy one. Of the following strategies you're about to see, which has been shown to provide students the greatest growth over time? Is it explicit direct instruction in red? Is it questioning in blue? Is it cooperative learning in yellow? Or is it peer tutoring in green? Go ahead and lock in your answer. Which of these strategies gives us the most bang for our buck? Again, engagement does not live in the space of uh, great tools. It lives in the space of great strategies. All of these are great strategies. Which of them gives us the most bang for our buck? Go ahead and lock in your answer. We're over 300. Final three seconds, and we'll see what the final answer is. Surprise. Explicit direct instruction, according to John Hattie's work, has an effect size of around six tenths. What does that mean? Now, uh, uh, that means explicit direct instruction, when implemented with fidelity, can give our kids about a year and a half worth of academic growth over a single year's worth of time. Let me put that in perspective for you. Reciprocal teaching, the close reading strategy that we just talked about, has an effect size of greater than seven tenths, nearly eight tenths. What does that mean? That means that that instructional strategy, when implemented with fidelity, can give our kids nearly two years of academic growth over a single year's worth of time. We have to know what these strategies are, and we have to know how to implement them because that is the place where engagement lives. Yes, using tools like, like this, like Kahoot, are great, they're fun, they're wonderful, but at the same time, they are not pedagogy. If you think about right now what I'm doing, I'm using a digital tool to support an instructional strategy. The instructional strategy I'm using right now is explicit direct instruction. Sometimes there are times when we just have to tell people things. But we can use tools like Kahoot to support explicit direct instruction to make it more effective and efficient than it's ever been before. So I want us to start to think about in those moments of synchronous learning, which tools are we using and how are we using them, not just independently because we think they're engaging, but how are we using them to support instructional strategy to make instructional strategy more effective and more efficient? What's interesting is the number one most frequently used educational strategy across the country is explicit direct instruction. And you all have just told me, we don't even think it works all that well when compared to some of our other strategies. So again, lock into instructional strategy, lock into pedagogy, get as excited about pedagogy as we've gotten about technology. Now, having said that, uh, let's take a look at who the winner is. Green Penguin, congratulations. You were third place out of uh, over 400 people. Power Duck, well done in second place. And first place was Amazing Kitten. If you are Amazing Kitten, do me a favor, let me know in the chat window uh, and I will be sure mail you a prize when this is all said and done. Uh, now, having said that, let me stop sharing for just a moment.
and let's get back to the task at hand. Uh, let's continue to talk about engagement. Again, engagement lives in the place where we are using strong pedagogy, not just strong technology. Uh, so uh, I'll, uh, oh goodness, hold on just a second. Let me, I've got the Kahoot song playing on my computer and it's driving me more than moderately insane. Uh, good, are we, uh, give me a thumbs up, uh, Mike and Michael, if we're back to the slide. Awesome, great. Um, so let me, and let me open up the chat so I can uh, make sure to see what we've got going on here. Duh, duh, duh. Uh, Emily Davidson, congratulations, second grade, Spencer School, uh, nicely done, nicely done. Um, oh, uh, yeah, great. Let me clarify this too. Elizabeth, you asked a really great question in the chat. You said, can you clarify the difference between explicit direct instruction and lecture? Such an important question. Because again, uh, I, told you for, I told you for my next book, uh, uh, I was asking uh, teachers, how many instructional strategies uh, can you name and describe with accuracy versus digital tools? I'll tell you, your average classroom teacher nationwide can only name and describe about three instructional strategies uh, and name how to deliver them with accuracy. Uh, also, your average teacher nationwide can name approximately six digital tools. So again, evidence that there is a tool surplus and a strategies deficit. Even explicit direct instruction is often mislabeled. Um, so let me give you a perfect example. Uh, if your screen is blank, it's because I'm showing a, a blank slide. That's okay. Um, so oftentimes people use explicit direct instruction and lecture as though they are synonyms. They are not. Uh, lecturing is not explicit direct instruction. Lecturing is included in explicit direct instruction, but explicit direct instruction is a carefully choreographed sequence of events that includes lecturing and questioning and relationship building and discourse that occurs between teacher and student and ideally students and one another. Great question. Uh, so I'm gonna take a moment here and I'm gonna showcase uh, my number one favorite instructional strategy on planet Earth, and that is reciprocal teaching. Uh, you'll see how to implement it. I love this strategy. It can be used anytime kids read anything, anywhere, any grade level, any content area. Yes, math teachers, I'm talking about you. Yes, art teachers, I'm talking to you. I'll give you multiple examples of how you could use this strategy tomorrow if you wanted to. So here's what's going to happen. In just a moment, uh, I'm going to show you the title of a text we are going to read. Uh, the title will show uh, quickly. It will flash on. It will flash off. And then I'm going to ask you to make a prediction. What do you think we're going to read about based only on the title? And I'm going to ask you to type that prediction into the chat. All right. Now, some of you at some point are going to want to be mad at me because of the speed at which this title will flash on and off. Uh, I'm going to encourage you to work through that. It's going to be very fast. You're not going to have enough time. It's all right. We're all going to get through this together. Ready? Uh, here comes the title for what we're about to read. On your mark, get set. That's all you're going to get. That's all you're going to get. Uh, again, I know it was very fast. Make a prediction. No right or wrong answers uh, at this point. Good. Linda says from rags to riches. Excellent. Good. Jason said. Uh, Jeremy thinks it's about a homeless person. Good, good, good. Uh, somebody said they think it's a biography. So this is really interesting, right? Like some of you are keying on subtext. Like you saw that you thought rags to riches. Uh, and so you think this is about a story of a homeless person. Uh, some of you are keying on the name that showed up in the top line. Uh, so take a look at some of the chat uh, that's going on. Interesting to see what predictions show up. Some of you think it's a biography. Some of you think it's a, about a, a homeless man uh, and a, about a person who made some money. Awesome predictions. Awesome predictions, you guys. Uh, here's what we're going to read about. The actual title is Jacob Davis from Rags to Rivets in Reno, Nevada. Uh, Let's narrow those predictions. Everyone do me a favor. Go to menti.com. Everyone go to menti.com real quick. And as you go to menti.com, I will do the same. Go to menti.com and I am going to ask you uh, to narrow those predictions a little bit. You're going to read Jacob Davis from Rags to Rivets in Reno, Nevada. Go to menti.com, enter code 301473. Thumbs up, guys, if you can see it on the screen. menti.com. Excellent. Let's narrow our predictions. Now that you know the actual title, Jacob Davis from Rags to Rivets in Reno, Nevada, uh, make a prediction. Do you think this is going to be about a man's journey from homelessness to middle class stability in the age of the Industrial Revolution? Do you think it's going to be about the successful World War II marketing campaign featuring Rosie the Riveter? 
tale of a struggling tailor who changed the face of fashion, or the tragic tale of a gambler who invented the ribbit and squandered his fortune. Again, the title of the text we're about to read is Jacob Davis from Rags to Ribbits in Reno, Nevada. And go ahead and lock in your answer. The nice thing is on Mentimeter, you can see what your peers are choosing. Uh, and as the answers are coming in, go ahead and take a look. This gives me tons of information as the teacher in a remote and synchronous learning environment. We know feedback has an effect size of 0.73. Again, you're talking nearly two years of academic growth over a single year's worth of time when students give you feedback about what they know and don't know. 80 of you at this point think this is about a man's journey from homelessness to middle-class stability in the age of the Industrial Revolution. You know what that tells me as the teacher? It tells me that now 94 of you think subtext is super important in predictive analysis. 28 of you think this is about the successful World War II marketing campaign featuring Rosie the Riveter. You know what that tells me? That tells me that 28 of you are keying in on a singular vocabulary word. You think the word rivet is the thing that unlocks your predictive analysis. Again, great predictions. 57 of you think this is about the tale of a struggling tailor who changed the face of fashion. And 86 of you think this is about the tragic tale of a gambler who invented the rivet and squandered his fortune. That tells me 87 of you know exactly what happens in Reno, Nevada. Now, no matter what you picked, these are great predictions. Thank you very much. We are about to read about the tale of a struggling tailor who changed the face of fashion for generations to come. If you picked that answer, congratulations, you are correct. Now, uh, as we move back into uh, our reading for just a moment, keep in mind, uh, you can, if you'd like to read this text, I'll show it in front of you. If, you like, if you'd like to have it on your desktop, you can go to tinyurl.com forward slash Jacob Davis RTR, as in rags to rivets. And you can have this reading right in front of you. You can pull it up on your phone. Feel free to go to tinyurl.com forward slash Jacob Davis RTR, as in rags to rivets, or I'll show the reading up on the screen. It's entirely up to you how you want to access it. Sidebar, uh, so much about remote learning is about voice and choice. We can provide voice and choice for kids really simply by saying uh, they can access text in multiple ways. Now, if you are one of the people who is going to tinyurl.com forward slash Jacob Davis RTR, to access this text, please do me a favor. When you arrive at this text, do not read it yet. Eyes here, do not, uh, eyes here, right? What does this immediately make you wanna do when I tell you not to read this text? Makes you wanna read it. Good, I win. So much about engagement is just about understanding human behavior and how the brain works. The minute we tell kids not to do something, what does it make them wanna do? It makes them wanna do that thing. Guys, we're no different as adults. The minute I told, hey, eyes here. The minute I told you not to read this, all you wanted to do was read it. And I don't want you to read it. Uh, here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to just scan this document. All we're looking for are words and phrases that could be pot potentially unfamiliar to say like your average seventh grader, right? I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds to scan this text. You're looking for words and phrases that could be potentially unfamiliar to your average seventh grader. Here we go, here's page one for any of you looking right here. Page one, just scan, 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 scan. You got about 10 seconds left on this page. If you think I'm going too fast, it's because you're trying to read, not scan. Again, scan, scan, scan. You're looking for words or phrases that could be potentially unfamiliar to a seventh grader. Here's page two, again, scan, scan, scan. Words and phrases that could be unfamiliar to your average seventh grader. Take a look, scanning for important vocabulary that could be potentially unfamiliar. Final five seconds, four, three, two, and one. Enter into the chat window. Throw, throw some vocabulary words out there that could be potentially unfamiliar to your average seventh grader. Throw them into the chat. Let's see what we got. Good, durable. Yeah, some of you are putting that phrase in there. It's pronounced Serge de Nîmes right? Emigrate. Yeah, emigrate's a good one. They're going to see the word emigrate, but they're going to think the word emigrate. Excellent. Good. Dry goods. You mash those two words together, they might struggle. Good, 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 good. I see emigrate. I see durable. I see patent. Patent. Great vocabulary word. Good. Good, good, good. So uh, I won't do it right now, but I'll tell you what. Here's what I would do if I had a group of kids actually in this space. Uh, I would say, hey, you know what? Here are three vocabulary words. I've chosen the three, uh, same three many of you have chosen. Here are three vocabulary words that I think show up that are really, really important in this text. And here's what I would do with kids. 
uh, I would say, hey, you know what? Top third, uh, your word is emigrate. I would take a look at my class list and I would say, top third, your word is emigrate. You have 45 seconds to go find me something in your house that you think best represents the word emigrate. Uh, next third, you have the word durable. Bottom third, you have the word patent. And then send the kids out to go find a visual representation that they think best represents that word. Two things. When we think about vocabulary uh, strategies, we have to understand that there's no comprehension without picturing. Let them go out and find a visual image. Second, it will force them to a place where if they don't know the meaning of that word, they have to go look it up and gain enough understanding to come back with a visual representation. Again, vocabulary matters. We're going to talk more about why. But I'll tell you what, after the predictive analysis, this is what I would do with kids. Make sure we're clear on these three vocabulary words. And then here's what I would do. After kids popped up in front of the camera and they showed their visual representation, uh, I'll tell you this. I've done this with kids before. Some kids for emigrate uh, will show a picture of like a door to their house. And they said, uh, I chose the picture of a door because I think it represents uh, exiting, leaving, because emigrate means to leave your home country. Uh, some people uh, for the word patent would hold up like a Nike shoe and they said like, hey, I think this is a good representation for patent because again, Nike has a patent on this product and the air sole that goes in it. Great visual representation for packet. Uh, durable. I've seen uh, people hold up things like uh, a Yeti coffee mug and been like, hey, I've got this mug uh, and I'm holding this up because uh, it, it's durable. It's long lasting. We've had it forever. Again, visual representations. Predict, clarify. Then I'd have kids go through and read the text. We are clarifying now. Yes, John, I'll outframe and I'll clarify all of this for you here momentarily. After kids have clarified this vocabulary, then have them go back and read the text in its entirety at their own pace. This can be something that after a live session, you send them to do, and then you come back and complete the second half of reciprocal teaching the next time they're with you. Send them out to read the text. Let them read the text at their own pace. pace. Let them have voice and choice. And then as they come back, start to challenge them. Say, hey, top third of the group, emigrate group, uh, the people who found em uh, the emigrate uh, visual representation, come up with one question where all the reader has to do is go directly back to the text to find the answer. Have them shoot that question into Padlet. Uh, group number two, durable group. Say, hey, I want you to come up with a question that includes at least two of our new vocabulary words in the actual question. And then group number three, uh, I want you to come up with a, uh, a, a question uh, that begins with, in your opinion, and requires the reader to state in op an opinion that they have about the text. And have those three groups put those three scaffolded questions out into Padlet somewhere. They can put those questions into Padlet, then they can go into the comments section, and then they can answer those questions in an asynchronous environment. And then last but not least, here's what I'll often have kids do. I'll send them to Flipgrid. I'll send them to Flipgrid and say, hey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to summarize the text that we just read in 30 seconds or less. They'll go to Flipgrid, their cameras will pop on. You can set the limit to 30 seconds and say, I want you to summarize this text and include somebody wanted, but, then, and so in your summary of this text. Predict, clarify, question, summarize. Now, let's outframe for just a moment. I just walked you through sort of like from a learner's perspective, uh, what this might look like. Let's outframe. Let's step outside of this experience, look back in on it through the eyes of a teacher, because what we've just modeled is reciprocal teaching. It is reciprocal teaching in a remote and synchronous environment using both synchronous and asynchronous tools. Step number one to reciprocal teaching, predict. Get kids to engage in predictive analysis. Think about how we started doing that. Really simply, flash on the title, flash off, type in your prediction in the chat. Super low tech to no tech option. Now, think about how we used Mentimeter to add to the predictive analysis moment, elevate it make, it, make that strategy more effective and efficient. Think about how it gives every single child a voice and an anonymous voice in the remote learning space. Step number one, get kids to predict. Step number two, get kids to clarify important vocabulary before they read text, before they read text, before they read text. Even some of our most proficient readers, what will they do when they come across a vocabulary word that they don't know? They will skip it. Now, we can address important vocabulary on the front end 
by getting them to clarify important vocabulary and to attach visual imagery to that vocabulary. Guys, so often we overlook vocabulary uh, as though it's unimportant. I'll tell you, this shows up in my book. When you take a look at kids who come from households that are typically identified as wealthy, uh, typically uh, by uh, between two and three years of age, they have a working vocabulary of around 1,200 words. Those are kids from families identified as wealthy. Now, when you take a look at kids who typically come from middle income families, they typically have a working vocabulary by the age of two or three of about 800 to 850 words. And when you take a look at, uh, at kids who come from families uh, who are on welfare, by the age of two or three, they typically have a working vocabulary of between 450 and 500 words. That's how quickly the achievement gap shows up. Guys, the achievement gap shows up in children long before they arrive with us. And so we've got to get good about vocabulary. Now, how are most teachers uh, uh, offering up new vocabulary words? Here's your list. Write down the definition. We know that that's not a strategy that works well. Even though it's old, it doesn't mean it's good. We have to set that aside, and we've got to use vocabulary strategies that we know work for kids. Get them to predict, clarify, then read the text. After they read the text, get them to both ask and answer questions. This is the one most teachers frequently get wrong because we think we should be asking the questions, but we've got to get kids to ask the questions. Think about the scaffolds that I gave for question uh, asking. Scaffold number one, ask a question that all the reader has to do is go uh, directly back to the text to find the answer. Boom, level one blooms. Scaffold number two. Scaffold number two was uh, create a question that includes at least two of our previously discussed new vocabulary words. Boom, level two, three blooms. Third scaffold, create a question that begins with in your opinion, requires the reader to state an opinion that they have about the text. Bam, level five, six blooms. It costs me nothing in terms of prep time as the teacher. It means everything for kids in terms of asking rigorous and relevant questions. And then last but not least, summarize. All right, get them to summarize uh, in tools like Flip Flipgrid. If you teach littles, recognize that summarize is not the skill that comes first. Instead of asking them to summarize, ask them to retell. Guys, this is an instructional strategy that can be used anytime kids read anything, anywhere, any grade level, any content area. So I'll tell you this, a uh, quick story. I was with uh, my children two summers ago uh, in New York. We went out to New York. My kids had never been there before. And we went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Awesome. If you've never been to the Met, incredible place. So I took my kids to the Met. It was a really slow day. And we walked into this room in the Met. And uh, me, my two children, my wife were the only people in this room. And on the wall, there's a Renoir and a Degas and a Van Gogh and a Monet. Beautiful. Unbelievable. And as we're standing there in this room, I looked over at my children. My son was here and my daughter was here. And I said, Everett, Charlotte, make a prediction. What do you think Vincent Van Gogh was feeling when he painted that picture right there? And my, and my daughter says to me, she says, Daddy, I think he was feeling sad. And I said, why do you think he was feeling sad? She was like, it's really dark. It looks like it was really cloudy. And I was like, oh, that's awesome, right? Great prediction. Tells me that you understand that things like light matter in the artistic space. Predict clarify. I said, Everett, Charlotte, do you guys know what the word impressionism means? And then we defined that word because it's a super important word in that, in that room. Uh, predict, clarify, question. I said, Everett, Charlotte, what is one question that you would ask, ask Vincent Van Gogh if you were standing right here, right now? And you know what my son says to me? He says, Daddy, I would ask him why he painted like this, instead of like this. I was like, oh, great question, right? predict, clarify, question, summarize. I said, Everett, Charlotte, summarize for me, what do all of these paintings have in common? And right there in the middle of the Metropolitan Museum art, of Art, both of my children went like this. Pop, 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 pop. I said, you're exactly right. These are all Impressionist painters. Predict, clarify, question, summarize. Anytime kids read anything, anywhere, these are the four behaviors of proficient readers. I'll tell you, I've been using this strategy with my own children at night since they were babies. Guess when? And I would encourage you to do this for those of you who are parents of small children tonight, story time. Every night at story time, we'd hold up a new book that they hadn't read before. And guess what we'd do? We'd picture walk the book, flip, flip, flip. We'd take a look at the pictures. We'd take a look at the, at the title. I'd set the book down and I'd say, Everett, Charlotte, make, make a prediction. What do you think this book is gonna be about? And they'd make their predictions. You think I had to teach the word prediction to start? Absolutely, predict. 
And then here's how we practice vocabulary. You know those sight words we're always practicing with kids? We started to point to those sight words within the context of the book. Let's practice the word the, and, is, when. That's how we practice our sight words. And then I'd point to a word that wasn't a sight word. And we'd sound it out phonetically. And I'd say, Everett and Charlotte, you guys know what that word means? And if the answer was ever no, guess what? Let's hop on daddy's phone and let's look up a picture that we think best represents that word. Predict, clarify. Then we'd sit down just like a normal family and we'd read the book together. My kids would sit here. I would read the book to them. And then after we were done reading the book, I'd say, Everett and Charlotte, what's one question that you would ask the main character of this book? I get a two for one deal out of that. Number one, my kids get to ask a question. And number two, I get to understand whether or not they know who the main character is. Predict, clarify, question. And then again, the skill for littles is not summarize, it's retell. I would say, Everett, Charlotte, retell this story to me. Use the words first, then, and finally as you retell me this story. Just so you know, even though it's a virtual environment, I feel your judgment, I reject your judgment completely. Uh, I know exactly who I am. Uh, I, I am a dork, admittedly, but I'm sorry, forgive me. Like, I'll be damned if I know these strategies exist and I don't use them with my own children. And I'll say this, not as a brag, but as a reinforcement, I will tell you as a kindergartner, my daughter read proficiently at the end of a second grade level. My son, as a second grader, over the Christmas holiday, read the entire box set of the Chronicles of Narnia. Guys, that has nothing to do with me, and don't tell her I said it, it has nothing to do with his mother. It has everything to do with the application of a high yield strategy over time, and that is where engagement lives. Our tools are supports to those engaging strategies. Our tools are not substitutes for those engaging strategies. <sighs> I will take a deep breath. Uh, Vivian is asking, is this slideshow uh, somewhere to access later on? Absolutely. Do me a favor, Michael, remind me. Uh, I'll email you the slideshow for distribution. Happy to do that. Thank you, Kathy. Reciprocal teaching exists on page 153 in the book. Michael is asking, can I go back one slide, please? Absolutely, I will. Uh, you want the Flipgrid slide for uh, summarization? Absolutely. And again, uh, uh, here's a promise that I'll make to you all. I'm going to try to model as much of this as possible in the very short amount of time that I have with you all so that ideally we can see that synchronous virtual learning environments are places where we can still use great tools like Flipgrid and Padlet and Mentimeter and Kahoot, but we have to make sure that we're using them in service to a greater overall strategy that we know works on behalf of our children because that is where engagement lives, not in the place that we just throw a tool at them uh, for the purpose of being the fun teacher. Having said that, final questions, comments, concerns, and or heart palpitations that I can address for you right at yes. this moment, if you please. My man, thank you. I, this is, wow. You know, I, I took a lot in. I love, you know, this is the time where we actually get to debrief. Uh, this whole presentation, you know, one thing that resonated with me, it wasn't even a part of your presentation, was talking about uh, language dancing versus directives, especially at that foundational level. You just essentially was talking about the Hart and Riesley study of the 33 million word gap, um, where kids come into school with, with uh, specific gaps, but it starts with the preparation gap, and we have been focusing on that um, with Sean DeBay in the early childhood uh, sector here in Middletown Public Schools. But Wes, you, you started referencing Hattie's uh, work, the, um, the 256, I might be outdated, but the 256 influences of achievement. And, you know, when I think about this space, right, you started talking about reciprocal teaching and the effect size of that. And then you started talking about uh, explicit direct instruction and the effect size of that. But now, you know, when I look at it, how can we create, and, and I don't know if we can do this, but how can teachers be able to build on self-efficacy, not collective self-efficacy from the teacher standpoint, which is 1.57 uh, for the effect size, but self-efficacy for students in this virtual learning space, 0.92. How do we intrinsically motivate them to keep them motivated so that now their self-efficacy is high, even though their world just flipped upside down on them, and teachers are, are strategically applying these strategies with, that are high leverage and high impact? Yeah, so absolutely. Motivation is the byproduct of two things, right? So number one, kids feel highly motivated when they exist in an environment. They know that traditionally they have had success and are likely to have success again in the future. And so when we look at kids and why they're not motivated, 
uh, either in, as remote learners or as face-to-face -face learners, in all likelihood, that comes from a place of some existing schema that they have around what it means to be a learner. And for them, what it means to be a learner, and we talked about this a little bit last time, is to exist in a place where you feel vulnerable and potentially you feel shame and you feel a sense of failure. And if you feel all of those three things and they haven't produced anything that in your eyes are worthwhile, chances are you're not going to re-enter into the space of feeling vulnerable and shameful and feeling a sense of failure. We have to uh, allow kids to experience school and know that, fa uh, that failure is feedback. Failure is not forever. And we've got to make sure that all of our kids have an opportunity to experience success, both in remote learning platforms and face-to-face. -face. That's number one. Number two, we all have to know that kids all listen to the same radio station. Quite frankly, so do adults. WIIFM, what's in it for me? We, gotta be able to, <laughs> we have got to be able to answer that question every time we go into the synchronous or asynchronous learning space with kids. We have to be able to answer the question like, what's in it for them? How does this have real world application in potentially unpredictable scenarios? Those two Thanks. things are at the forefront of motivation. Thanks, Wes. Wes, and, 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 and you, you talk about, um, and I got two more questions. Uh, you talk about feedback, right? We know that that has a high effect size. Uh, for achievement in this space, right? You gave one example, but what are some other examples that how teachers can provide feedback obsolete of just utilizing um, the, the digital tools to communicate with students for feedback? Good, so, rec so recognizing first and foremost that feedback is a two-pronged uh, strategy, right? We, all, we, we get one of those very clearly, that when we provide as teachers feedback to our students, they improve. But we gotta remember that feedback is a two-way street. So when you take a look at John Hattie's work, feed, feedback has an effect size of slightly greater than seven tenths. And that only exists when that feedback flows not just from teacher to student about what we know and don't know, but when it flows from student to teacher about what they know and don't know. And so using feedback tools, tools like Kahoot, right? So uh, I will tell you this, too often, I, Kahoot is one of the most frequently used and poorly used digital tools that I see used in classrooms nationwide. I can't tell you the number of times I've seen a teacher offer up a Kahoot, uh, the results will show up much like they did with us, where it's like, oh man, only about a fifth of you got this question right, bummer, sucks for us, and we move on. And in that moment, like your kids are offering you feedback. They're offering you like specific and valuable feedback that they don't know. And we can pause there. We can pause. We can teach and reteach before we move on. If, if I had been offering up uh, that Kahoot and it was clear that everyone in the room or 90% of the people in the room knew what reciprocal teaching was, I would have spent two seconds talking about reciprocal teaching and I would have moved on to my next question. So recognize like we can use the tools that exist at our disposal to get feedback from kids about what they know and don't know so that we can spend less time talking about things that they already understand and more time filling in those gaps. Like that's where feedback uh, fulfills its promise. Yeah, yeah. Um, Wes, when we talk about reciprocal teaching, right, and the effect size that it has and the impact and the leverage that it could obtain um, for student achievement outside of let's say, um, English language arts, let's say the arts, the um, uh, music, science, math, PE, how would you be able to apply reciprocal teaching in that context to ensure that um, the vitality of the implementation is not compromised? Yeah, so it's, so it's about getting creative. Uh, I gave you the art example. Uh, I've given you a literacy example. I will tell you, I use reciproc reciprocal teaching all the time uh, with my kids in math too. So Think about those math worksheets that our kids often go home with, right? On the front side, they have those workable problems. And then immediately when they flip over to the back, what exists on the back of almost all of those worksheets? Word problems. And so here's what I do. As my son's sitting at the bar and he's working on his worksheets, I listen real close for him to flip the page. And when he flips the page, I come over and bam, I put my hand on the top of that, uh, that worksheet. And I say, Everett, I'm gonna give you about six seconds to look at this word problem. You're gonna have six seconds to make a prediction what you think this problem is asking you to solve for. Boom, and I reveal it. One, two, three, four, five, six, and I cover it back up with my hand. And he'll say, Dad, 
uh, I, I think it's about uh, subtracting uh, fractions. And I'll say, good, tell me why you think that. He's like, well, uh, I, saw, uh, I saw the word uh, difference and I saw a numerator and a denominator. It's like, awesome, great. I'm glad you're looking at the right things. Uh, didn't always go like that. I'll tell you, there are some times I would say, Everett, count to six, boom. And he would say, oh, I think it's about Patrick's chili recipe. Like, no, 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 dude. We are, we are not looking at the right things here. Now, why do I give six seconds for a math problem? Because there's been some research around mathematics to show that uh, on average, children of almost any age, guess how long they'll look at a math problem before they determine what they think the problem is about? About six seconds. They'll offer up about six seconds of cognitive thought before they make a determination about what they think the problem is asking them to solve for. And so I, I ask them to make a prediction. You can do that in the virtual space as well. Predict, clarify. Then I'll have them read the word problem out loud and I'll say, Everett, clarify for me, what are the most important vocabulary words in this word problem? You know what? I hope he pulls out the verbs. Those are the doing things. I hope he pulls out vocabulary like less than, numerator, denominator. Like, I hope he pulls out those vocabulary words. They're going to be important for the solution. Predict, clarify, question. Then I'll say, Everett, ask this word problem as a question that is more likely for kids your age to be able to understand. Because that's what we want kids to do in mathematics. We want them to look at the problem, synthesize the information, and then re-ask the question in a way that makes sense predict, clarify, question, and then last but not least, the fourth step of reciprocal teaching, summarize. I don't care that they summarize. Substitute that for another S word that's associated with math, solve. Predict, clarify, question, solve. Nice, nice, Wes. Wes, I know we got about three more minutes, right? But, you know, we've been talking about um, the dynamics of classroom instruction, right? Effects effect sizes with uh, specific influences around achievement underscored by Patty's work. But now I want to just shift the, so we have this collective mindset, right? You said at the outset, and I wrote this down, and I just want you to expand on it before we all go. I know we're going to see you uh, in a couple weeks, but I want you to expand upon this sentiment that you stated at the outset of this presentation. Tools are much less than strategies. My teachers are ready to go deliver the quality of instruction that they've been delivering in this distance learning environment, right? This is uh, Teacher Appreciation Week, and we appreciate you being here. But before we go, what is the one lasting point that you want to make with the Middletown Public Schools practitioners that are having cataclysmic impact on their students by this phrase, tools are much less than strategies? That tools will never replace what great teachers have to offer, right? They will never supersede what great teachers have to offer. And one of the challenges that I'd offer to every single one of you out there right now is this. Uh, if I were to ask you the question, like what is the thing you are awesome at, right? What is the instructional strategy? What is the thing that you, like, are you the concept mapping master of the universe? Are you incredible at Socratic seminar, right? Are you wonderful at engaging your kids in real world problem solving? Like number one, I hope you can answer that question immediately. I hope you could tell me immediately, here's the thing I'm great at. Uh, because I hope you're bringing that thing into the remote learning space. And if you're not, I wanna encourage you to because it's the thing that tools can't replace. Re tools cannot replace the thing that you are amazing at. And if you are a great storyteller, if you're amazing at relationships, or if you're amazing at this instructional strategy, make sure it comes with you into the remote learning space and that you haven't replaced it with a tool because you have in your mind that, hey, you know what, like, because we're in this space, like, I have to use a ton of tools. So figure out the thing that you're awesome at, figure out how tools that exist can support that thing to be more effective and efficient, not to replace it. Because I'll tell you what, the things that kids are needing right now more than ever is not more stuff, it's more of you. Weston, my man. It is always a pleasure to have you on. Um, we got to speak offline because this Sunday is episode seven of eight for um, uh, The Last Dance with Michael Jordan. Got to, you know, get your perspective on that because uh, Jordan is the GOAT, Wes. So thank you so yeah, much. Absolutely. Michael, <laughs> Michael, thank you, my friend. Hey, thank you to everyone out there. Uh, I, I, I'm so grateful to you. Uh, happy, happy Teacher Appreciation Week. I hope uh, that you are feeling appreciated by people around you. Uh, uh, more so, I hope you are taking some time to offer yourself some appreciation. 
Uh, make sure that you are being good to yourself. Make sure that you are surrounding yourself with people who are being good to you. Because uh, I'll tell you what, you, you are the linchpin that makes this whole thing go. So, so grateful. Thank you guys so much for all you do. Absolutely. Happy Teacher Appreciation Week, Middletown Public Schools. We'll see you soon. Take care.